where were you born and where did you grow up? And let's give a picture, like a visual picture of, of what the neighborhood or outside or what, what did that look like? So I was born in 1978 in Bogota, Colombia. Mm. And uh, for the first two decades of my life, I lived in Candelaria. Candelaria is the historic part of Bogota uh, that today is probably more recognized for uh, being a tourist uh, spot where you can go and see colonial houses, uh, a mixture of uh, Spanish architecture and uh, Native American uh, style as well to, to, to a certain degree a lot of uh, fabrics and a lot of uh, construction elements that you only find in in the americas and probably in particular on that part of colombia however i lived on the tallest building on that neighborhood which is a building that they built right before the pass law that wouldn't allow the construction of new buildings like that so uh, the building per se wasn't necessarily something that nice compared to the rest of the neighborhood. Now, this is a neighborhood that is next to the mountains in Bogota. And it's actually colder than the rest of Bogota because the clouds are constantly hitting the mountains and, and it rains a lot. If you go outside of that area, it's actually like two or three degrees warmer in average. So, so that's I was San born. Francisco, San Francisco weather, more or yeah, less. Yeah, actually pretty similar to San Francisco. By the way, it's now it's known today as a tourist spot. Back then, it was the place where you didn't want to go because it was one <laughs> of the uh, most dangerous places in, in Bogota. And in fact, there was a kind of a practical curfew, curfew at 8 p.m. Like at, after 8 p.m., you didn't want to get out of your house because it was going to be dangerous unless you called a taxi and the taxi took you out. Got you. And so did you, during your childhood, was it, because you're in this tall building, no curfew, I mean, a curfew after 8 p.m., uh, what, what, did your, what did your days uh, look like? Did you have, like, play dates within the tower? Or uh, how, how did that look like? Well, it's so, so downtown Bogota is at the end of the day pretty similar to any other downtown. You you find probably a lot of young people, a lot of professionals, but not a lot of kids. Actually, there were no parks around really. Uh, and in my building, I think that the only other kids were five or six, seven years older than I was. So I actually had a relatively lonely childhood, which looking back, I, I believe it ended up helping me. Uh, mm -hmm. develop some of the skills that I developed because pretty much my best friends was were my my blocks the equivalent of Lego we didn't have enough money to buy Lego so we had Estralandia which was the Colombian equivalent <laughs> Estralandia. Uh, so, so I played a lot of Estralandia back then and, and buildings and, and such uh, <laughs> very very cool okay and then uh, in terms of school was the school nearby or how did that look like well, uh, or did when, you? Yeah. How then did you go? Did you go to school during that time? Yes, okay. and uh, I ended up attending. Uh, get ready, German-inspired military Catholic academy. So <laughs> not just not just <laughs> private, not just Catholic, which is already strict, military, which is yeah. more strict, and then German. Yeah. Wow. German, insp German inspired, by the way, like all of the symbols and icons and, and shields yeah. and such were actually uh, 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 brought from uh, a former German school uh, that the owners used to have or something like that. Anyway. Uh, and Did the you reason have to I, wear I, military uniforms? Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah, yeah. No. From, and, and that was military? my school. Yeah, military? Yeah, yeah. Military? I learned, I learned to, to shoot rifles when I was 12 years of age. In school? Yeah. In school, yeah, yeah. <laughs> they, they took you and they teach you to shoot. But, and there, there are two reasons for that. One is that the owner of the school was friend of a friend of a friend, and my my mom ended up teaching uh, history uh, in there on that school. Got so it. I got a scholarship, uh, being uh, his uh, her uh, son. I could go there with without having to pay for education. And uh, the other practical reason is that in Colombia. Uh, military service is compulsory. You have to do it uh, unless you go to a military academy, 
in which you learn how to be ready for war, but uh, you don't have to actually go to the jungle and fight people. So, so if you want to play it safe, you go to a military academy uh, in Colombia. So, so it was a wow. twofold reason for that. Wow, that makes a lot of sense. So you're in school, they teach you how to shoot. Did you see an inkling of, of some form of entrepreneurship even at that time? Yeah. So this is something that I believe I haven't shared before. I usually share the story of my first company when I was, when I was 14, but I actually started uh, doing this earlier. Yeah. Uh, and that is because when I was, when I, when I went from the primary building to the secondary building, uh -huh. um, I still was one of the smallest and the when, young, I was the you youngest primary... and one of the smallest. When you say primary or secondary, you mean uh, like middle school or, or? Well, yeah, in Colombia you have from first uh, grade to fifth grade, and that's uh, primary. And then you have secondary, which is from sixth grade to 11. Got so it. like middle oh. school and high school are combined. Combined. Over Got there, it. Yeah. Okay, so when you went to towards middle to school. To the equivalent of middle school, yeah. Got it. And uh, I was the youngest in my, my class. I started quite young, and I was also the shortest. And um, people used to bully me a lot. And, uh, and uh, one of the things they did is, is whenever I bought my, my food on, on for the break, during the break, they would actually come and, and eat it. Like I would open my, my, my chips and they would go and grab and all of them. Got it. Uh, so and I didn't have enough money to buy more food. So I started figuring out ways of getting more money so that I could buy two packs of chips one for me to eat and the <laughs> other one for them to, to, oh, to eat. Jake. oh man that's intense so so i started offering my my uh uh student mates uh, my my fellows my yeah my classmates yeah um the opportunity of buying homework so i would actually do the homework for them and they would buy it from me and wow. uh Early on, this is, I started doing that on, uh, on, on seventh grade. And, uh, you must have I hit realized, the jackpot in that. I'm sure you had a line of people wanting to do that. Well, I, I became really good at it. I actually, I developed three uh, writing styles. I had access to different types of papers. So that it was, I became <laughs> really good. I, I learned how to write typos on purpose. Uh, oh, so that they wow. End, and, and, uh, this is early CIA training. Yeah, yeah. But the coolest thing is that I realized that I could actually action the work. So whenever the teacher left the, the room and he, and he had uh, assigned us a kind of complex homework, I would raise my hand and I said, okay, I'm going to action this. I'm going to action three. So the people <laughs> that pay the most were the ones that I would actually do the homework for them. And I usually, depending wow. on the complexity, I would do two, three, sometimes four. But then that to make it really better... I offer a satisfaction warranty. So we used to be great from one to 10. So this is the amount of money you're going to give me. And for every grade <laughs> below 10 that, that you get, I'm going to give you a prorated refund. So I ended up raising the prices. So I ended up actually making good money for being you know, a, a, a student in, in seventh grade. <laughs> that is genius. I love that. That's when I fell in love with actions uh, and, and <laughs> marketplaces, I guess. <laughs> I love it. So you, uh, all right. So you went through school, um, and then what? What happened after? What take us to? What was the? What was the first company that you then ended up? I mean, after school, that you ended up working for or your own? What was it? So, um, for, for background, I should probably go back a little bit. Yeah, and that is, I saw my my. All this memory is the time is when I saw a computer for the first time. I was four years of age, uh, and I remember very vividly the video game that I played. It was a car that was uh, driving through a road, and the road would narrow and narrow and narrow, and the game would be more and more difficult as the road uh, narrowed, of course. Right. And from that moment on, I uh, started asking adults for a computer every time I came across a new adult, right? <laughs> especially uh, my mom and my dad. Now, uh, my dad left home when I was a year of, uh, old, mm -hmm. but I talked to him every now and then, and uh, I bugged him so much that uh, 
once he told me, okay, you're going to go to school now. If you get the best grades in your school, I'm going to get you that computer. So I was five when he, when he told me that. By the time I was six, almost seven, in mm -hmm. second grade in primary school, I was able to get the best grades on that military academy. It was uh, 3,000 people plus, but I was able wow. to get two months in a row the best grades. Was because I became obsessed with the idea. I became like right. a nerd, the ultimate nerd uh, <laughs> uh, for, to, for me to be you able to get the grades. You had a very clear sight. Yeah, and uh, so I got the grades, I got the certificate. I asked my mom to get me in touch with my dad. After two weeks or so, finally, I had him on the phone. I told him that. Uh, here is here are the grades that you challenged me to obtain. Now you can get me the computer. That was 1984, and uh, to this day I'm still waiting for the computer. Oh no! Oh man, I was waiting for a happy ending. Oh no! That wasn't a happy ending. In fact, eventually he had a business that sold computers, and he actually paid me with a bad check. <laughs> so, oh my god! That, so so he actually owes me two computers. <laughs> <laughs> oh uh, man so you did you and because you were in your in the type of neighborhood you were in did you you didn't have access to people that with a computer or did you did you have no there that, no no the the, so the the first time that i had uh access to computer well, in school we had like 30 minutes of, of computer time uh, every week or so that wasn't enough for me I was obsessed with the idea of you know using computers more and more but the first time that I had like daily access is when my mom uh, joined a university that had a computer classroom and I would go there and wait for the classroom to close and I would sneak in after 5 p.m. when they shut it down and I would just jump from computer to computer finding what diskettes uh, they had uh, in there oh. and I would just play with whatever they had so sometimes I was lucky and I found a video game sometimes I found myself learning how to use Lotus 1, 2, 3 and oh, math and the uh, right. and um, yeah but eventually so what happened is I was really obsessed with the idea I really wanted a computer mm -hmm. uh, and uh, by the time I was 14 and uh, I got a letter from the bank where I had some savings and I had the equivalent of like $50 in savings or so. Mm -hmm. And the letter said, congratulations, you're going to move from the account for ch children to the account for uh, teenagers and young adults. And these are all the benefits. Like now you get to have a debit card and whatever. And yeah. the very last one is now you have uh, access to credit. And that was... <laughs> The best news ever for me. I can get a credit. Now I know how I'm going to get a computer. So I started thinking about how to, how to pay for that credit. And this is when um, it became more and more popular for especially university students to write their thesis on computers so they could edit them. Mm -hmm. uh, but they didn't have computers. So what started happening in Colombia back then is that they would pay people with computers for them to to um, to use it um, to not no, for not not for them to use it for them to actually write the 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 thesis oh. and have a draft of the thesis in electronic format that they could print show to their teachers their professors fix it and uh, it was kind of a private secretary kind of private data entry work for you know, for university students right right uh, so I, I saw an opportunity there and. Uh, I, uh, I had one friend that had a computer. Um, actually, it wasn't his computer. It was the computer of his brother, so I couldn't use it. But anyway, he printed for me a sign that said, yep. we do data entry work for college students. It is our phone number. And I posted those signs all over the neighborhood. And the first time it didn't work, I had to iterate. I realized that people actually wanted to see the address. They didn't want to call. They wanted to go. So I did it for a second time. They went there. And... Uh, uh, in fact, I started uh, like getting doing some kind of market research, not realizing that that was market research. Today, they call it the lean <laughs> right, startup. Right. Take it until you make it. But anyway, <laughs> I got an idea of what kind of volume I could actually do, how much I could charge. Initially, uh, indeed, I had to fake it until you make it because people will get there. I was 14, and they would say, well, 
are you going to be the one doing this for me? So they wouldn't trust me. So I would say, no, it's my mom, but my mom is not here, but I can give you the pricing. <laughs> and, uh, and then they would say, okay, here is the paper. Here is the, 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 what I have written. Please transcribe it. And I would have to say, oh, no, we are too busy. We have two months of work right now, but we didn't have a computer, right? So <laughs> we couldn't deliver what we were selling. But that information, I took it, and I went to the bank with the pamphlet that they had mailed to me. And uh, I waited in line uh, to talk to the teller. And I told the teller, teller, I'm, tomorrow I'm going to be turning 15. I'm going to be switching my account to this new account based on what you told me. And I yeah. get access to credit. To the teenage so adult credit. account. Yeah, that's hilarious. <laughs> and the guy cracked up. And then, no, oh, you need to be uh, at least 18 and have a job for you to get a credit. This is not for you. I was really pissed. Uh, and uh, my, that memory is kind of blurry, but I remember being really mad. And yeah. for some reason, I ended up in the office of the, ban of the manager of the bank. And, uh, and she asked me, where are your parents? Why are you asking for money? Like, she was really concerned that I, <laughs> that I needed to ask for money yeah. to a bank. That you needed not, a credit right away. Yeah. yeah. And uh, not realizing it, I ended up making my first, like, company pitch. Uh, because she asked a lot of questions about the business model that I had in mind and such. Two days later, right after I turned 15, I ended up getting a credit for 820,000 pesos, wow. uh, which is the amount of money I needed yeah. extra on top of the savings that I had to be able to buy a computer. I uh, got my computer and I founded my first company, which was only me working part-time, but I had so much time to think about the name that I ended up naming it Apache Axe Cybernetic Enterprises Limitada. It's for legal why why didn't you make it longer? That's <laughs> <laughs> I couldn't think of more names for that. And now, that was my first business, a data entry business. And uh, later, only later, uh, many years later, I, I, as I learned about the banking system and such, is that I ended up realizing that uh, the bank didn't give me the loan. It was the bank manager herself, the one that gave me the loan out of her own bank uh, account. Wow. Uh, wow. I haven't been able to get in touch with her uh, again, but I'm, I'm trying to. I have, I have uh, made the, 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 the story as public as I can so that hopefully one day I'm going to be able yeah, to. Yeah, she can to reach her. out. Wow, yeah. that's incredible. You were in Colombia during one of its worst periods. Oh, yeah. You know, mm -hmm. with, with, uh, with crime, with the drug trade, you know, the kidnapping, all that stuff that was happening. And by the way, in 98, that was still pretty bad, wasn't it? Yes. Yes. I mean, the 90s, like each, each decade uh, brings different memories. But, but the 90s, uh, the beginning of the 90s, a lot of uh, uh, what we used to call narco-terrorism in Colombia. So... Uh, drug dealers doing terrorism against each other. Um, but that meant that every other day or so, there was a bomb exploding somewhere in Bogota. By the way, a lot of them used to explode in downtown Bogota. <laughs> so right. it was relatively common for us to be awakened by, by, by the shaking of a bomb having exploded. And I left much younger. I left at eight years old from Colombia. And, uh, and of course... I was I was in Cajica, which was a little farther from from the actual city, but just having your home broken into and all that stuff. I remember you know, years later, I, I had trouble like sleeping on my own. You know, I it took me a while. I think I I, I was like 15 years old with a beard, still sleeping with my parents. <laughs> <laughs> in the, like in the U.S., so my dad was like, "Look, man, you are way too freaking big for this bed. You got you got to find your own bed." Uh, did you do you have did any of that stick with you at all? Like reflecting back now or no? I value a lot peace of mind because I, I actually counted. I got robbed in Colombia ten times, uh, and. Any kind of, of, uh, of way you can rob people, uh, I was probably exposed to. So I was robbed uh, by uh, pickpocketing. I was robbed with uh, people with knives on the street uh, trying to get my sunglasses. I was robbed uh, at the business that we had uh, with a 
gun pointed at my face and oh, being no. uh, uh, like tied down in the back of the, no, of the office they came while into they were. The office. Yeah. Uh, I was robbed uh, by people that pretended to be owners of a company. They gave us a check. We delivered computers to their office. And next day, the checks uh, bounce, bounce back. We go to the office and the office doesn't exist any longer. Like wow. the 15 employees that were there were no longer there. The office was empty. So I. Uh, they, they tried to rob me while driving on my car, a car uh, uh, cutting me. So I ended up developing uh, a good sense of defense, like, like being aware of what's happening around me uh, all the time, like on the, on the traffic light, uh, being aware of the distance to the car in front of me, to the distance to the car behind me, to the height of the sidewalk so that in case I had to, I could uh, drive the car through the sidewalk and leaving. So... Wow, it's a like lot of cognitive load. It's a lot of cognitive load because you, you, you cannot think about your future. You cannot think about what to do, about how to do uh, uh, better in life. You're always thinking what might happen and how I'm going to be reacting to that situation. Survival. So, yeah. So when I came to the U.S. for the first time, it was a strange knowing that I could just let my mind wander and not having to be worried about what might happen to me or my loved ones. By far, 99% of Colombians are great people, but, but that 1% makes so much damage that they don't let the other 99% um, focus on things that they could be focusing on. Yeah, yep. And so you, you came to the U.S. Did you move uh, on your own at this point or who are you with? So I ended up moving actually with my dad and his family. Uh, we asked for a visa together. And uh, by the way, we were lucky uh, to, to get the visa because this is 1998 when we got the visas. 95% uh, of tourist visas in Colombia were being rejected. Uh, I'm, I'm not, that's the actual number, yeah, like 95% of visas. <laughs> you, you had to wait six to nine months for the appointment only to get rejected. Uh, wow. in most cases. Mm -hmm. So we were lucky and, and getting a visa was so difficult that everybody getting a visa, they would say, I'm out of here. And, uh, and even though I had a successful business, I was 19 by then and I already had a car. I was living by myself. So, I mean, for a, for a young person in Colombia, I, 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 oh, I, I had been able to achieve a lot and I was conscious of that. Uh, but I, I really wanted to explore new lands and new opportunities. And, and that's why I broke my business into pieces. I, I allowed some of the members of my team to continue working with the clients. And I got a one-way ticket. And I came to, to the U.S., to Boston. Initially, wow. I, I shared space with my dad and his family. But um, a few months later, I moved to Miami, where I had some other relatives that I had never seen. I mean, they were my relatives, but I had never met them. And at that time, so when you said we, was this already with Tanya or? So I, I met Tanya in Miami. Uh, so Tanya is your, so in Miami, let's, let's share that. How did you meet Tanya? What was going on? Well, I, um, my roommate was um, a journalist, a Colombian journalist. And uh, she used to uh, co-organize a uh, meetup for Colombian journalists uh, in Miami. Now, most of the Colombian journalists in Miami were people that had fled Colombia because they were uh, targeted by the many different uh, groups with weapons <laughs> in Colombia. Yeah. Uh, and uh, they were on asylum visas and such. So it became a group of like Colombian immigrants, Colombian expats living in Miami because they couldn't go back to Colombia. Back. Yeah. And uh, in one of those uh, meetups, which being a Colombian meetup, it was like 20 minutes of networking and two hours of dancing. <laughs> <laughs> that sounds about right. <laughs> yeah. Uh, it's, it's where I uh, met uh, Tanya. Tanya, uh, she... Uh, she, she didn't have that background of having to flee Colombia because of safety reasons, but, but she was in the, in the media industry. She was working uh, at a uh, Spanish radio station in, in Miami, uh, Caracol Radio. And, uh, and Caracol, that's, why she that's, a very big, uh, yep. that's a very big company. And that's, that's, how, that's when we met, and uh, I, she was kind of um, 
of an oasis for me because Miami, at least back then, used to be a very plastic city and such. And she was probably the least um, plastic person, the most real person that I had met in Miami to, to that time. Uh, we fell in love. Um, we uh, started living together within three months or so. And uh, we quickly set our goal to move to New York City. And uh, a year later, we were able to, to move to Flushing, New York on the very last stop of the F train. Wow. And by the way, why New York? Was it just because obviously the branding, the, or did you have family there or no? Uh, no, I just I, I just loved New York. The first time I visited New York, I, I felt at home. I so I, I was I, I had been living in Framingham, Massachusetts for five months, and everything was perfect. Like nobody went over the speed limit. Nobody gave the right of way. Uh, initially, it took like time for me to get used to that. Right. But eventually, I, I, I learned how important it is. But I go to New York. Uh, I went to New York for the first time. I remember parking nearby Radio City Music Hall. And after two blocks of walking, we see a cab, a yellow cab, uh, crossing a corner mm -hmm. and almost hitting a guy. And uh, the guy takes uh, an executive with a briefcase. Yeah. The guy takes his briefcase and he slams it, slams it on the <laughs> on the on the on the car, and the and the and the and the cab stops. The guy gets out with a bat and they are ready to fight. And eventually, like they realize this is a bad idea, and each man like goes. Uh, and that was the moment way. you stopped and said, "This is going to be my home." This is going to be. This is my place. This is my people. <laughs> no, like, like now I'm, I'm definitely more settled down. I have a daughter, so for yeah. me, that kind of, 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 uh, of activity is not necessarily uh, what yeah. I look forward to seeing right. now. You, yeah. But, but you back then, it was like, okay, this, this, this is real. This is not as perfect as what right. I thought. So yeah. I set my eyes on, on, on your city. I mean, not only because of that. You see I know, I know. The art, the, everything, you know. I the mean, culture, all, all of it. All of it. The yeah. energy, I'm sure. Yeah. So then you moved to Flushing. And um, what was, did, is this where VO, uh, Voice 123 began? Or what were you doing at that point? So uh, it's, the, the idea actually started in Miami. So, so Tanya, working at a radio station, she started to pursue a career in voiceovers. And uh, very quickly, as we met, she was she was uh, starting to do that. And uh, by the way, with in in um, <laughs> I love I love the the story in Miami. So Tanya wasn't how how did Tanya get introduced to the idea of voiceovers? Well, wasn't it that somebody like didn't come in for work one day and like she used to always joke around with her colleagues with a voice or something? What what was that? Yeah, she used to be the receptionist for the radio station. Mm -hmm. And, and uh, in fact, one day they were looking for, for a backup for one of the shows and, and uh, she volunteered and she became uh, one of the most known DJs in the night shows on that radio station. But she was actually doing like a fake voice. It wasn't her voice. It was like a, 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 the voice of a child. She was supposed to be like a, like a naughty 10 year old or something like that. <laughs> Only in a Latin radio station you're going to find that. <laughs> That's hilarious. Well, she learned about the voiceover industry and she realized that the, the money in voiceovers is usually not necessarily made being a DJ, but actually selling your voice for ads and commercials. So she started looking into that and uh, uh, we learned that one of the ways that uh, you would get work uh, especially as a Spanish voice actor, because her English is very good, but, but she focused on, on doing Spanish voices back then. Right. Uh, you had to pay a fee of um, between 400 and and $1,000 to a company that would take a 60-second demo of your voice, put it on a CD, and ship it to many agencies all over the place. That was one way. And they would get those CDs and listen to them, and if you're lucky, they ended up contacting you. Uh, another way is going through agents. So agents, uh, similar to on-camera uh, agents, mm -hmm. you would go there, they would cast you, and if they think that you have a future, they would uh, probably Represent work on a, on a, yeah, and work on a portfolio of your work to, to do it. So she also did that. 
uh, she paid uh, a few thousand dollars to, to to agents for them to do a photo shoot because back then you needed to be good looking to be a professional voice actor, apparently. Wow. Anyway, oh, uh, that's crazy. Uh, <laughs> neither of them delivered. They kept their her money. Uh, the 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 other venue, the CD thing, ended up working just a little bit. So as I had already some experience on 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 creating websites and such, we started looking for ways of doing that online, and we were surprised at uh, finding that nobody had created a casting service online for voiceovers. Uh, and actually, we were very surprised. Like 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 really like we should be missing the point. This should right. exist somewhere, but no, it didn't. So. We started working on, on the idea. We were working nights and weekends. Um, and uh, while I was coding the website, Tanya was collecting email addresses of people that had created their own websites, uh, voice actors that had created their own websites. And after six months of work or so, um, we launched Voice123. This is January 12th, I believe, 2003. And we emailed a bunch of people, a bunch, a bunch of talents, letting them know that now they could participate in this marketplace. And uh, very quickly, Voice123 became the largest marketplace of voiceovers out there. Today, we have 300,000 voice actors in the system, and uh, we have processed millions of auditions so far. That's, that's incredible. So you, you were coding. You were the one that were, was, was kind of creating it and putting it together, right? Yep. Uh, like the, the, the technical piece. Uh, was this just from your home with like a server? In, in what, what, what did that look like? Yes. So this is 2002, 2003. So there wasn't such a thing as AWS. Uh, you had to actually like yeah, rent Amazon, a physical uh, server somewhere. Right. right? So... So we did that. However, one of the things that we realized we wanted to do is we wanted to allow people to record their auditions with their own microphones in their computers. This is, this is when people were switching from modem to broadband, and, uh, and broadband was good enough to do that kind of recording. But that requires specialized software. Um, back then, for those that, uh, that, that were into, into these, uh, might remember that Macromedia launched Flash uh, communication, a Flash communication server, which was the first uh, technology ever that would allow you to record something via the browser with a microphone. But no company was hosting computers that had that software. So right. we had to set up a computer in our uh, studio. This is a studio the size of a living room where we were living really tiny <laughs> yeah. in, in, in Flushing. And... Uh, uh, whenever you visited the website, if you were auditioning for a project, you were actually connecting to the computer in our apartment. Yeah. Uh, and that computer had all of the auditions uh, for that. Once my sister visited us, and by mistake, uh, she switched off the wrong uh, light switch because it was actually connected to a light <laughs> switch. And Boys123 went down with it <laughs> for like two hours while we were able to go back. Oh, no! <laughs> you had all, uh, it was already on, and you already had people working. Did you lose the information or no? No, no, we didn't lose information, but we couldn't process auditions for like two hours. Um, so that's when we already had some, some, some good volume. But it, it took... It took um, almost a year um, before we could actually set up a proper server in uh, somewhere for it to, to manage the, how, the, the auditions. How did you go about communicating this to people? So one thing is building it, and the other yeah. thing is how do you, like, who did you say, all right, we're going to target this first, and how did you even reach out to them? How, how did that look? So on, on, we were quite ignorant uh, in terms of what we were uh, doing. And uh, looking back, that ignorance uh, probably ended up helping us make the bet that we made because, uh, like, if we had known more about user acquisition and MVP and angel investing and whatnot, right. uh, chances are we would have not done it because it was too risky. But that, that ignorance ended up uh, leading helping us to, to take the risk, yeah. So we really didn't do any research whatsoever in terms of of what the buyers were going to be. Like we knew about the talent side, the supply side on the, of the marketplace. You knew there was a the gap way. there, that there was a need, that, you know, it's crazy. No, on, honestly, we didn't know there was a need. And that's part of the huge ignorance we had. We knew there was a need for the supply side, yes, right, meaning talents wanted to get work. Right. But we had no idea 
about the buyers that needed those voice actors. Mm -hmm. um, so again, ignorance is, 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 in this case, ignorance is bliss because we ended up building something that actually people wanted, but we had never talked to anybody that had bought voiceovers before. Keeping in mind that you haven't talked to anybody, but you experienced it from the supply side, right? Yes. Like you, Tanya, had gone through the whole process. You guys were amazed that there was no sort of platform out there that could at least help someone like Tanya out in, in being able to connect her or him with other, you know, with, with buyers and, and do it in a way that was efficient and, and cost effective. And so you guys went about building it and not knowing what would happen. So how did you, how did you even test this in the supply side? Or did you immediately start reaching out to the buyers uh, with like Tanya as the example of one voiceover or how, how no. did it work? So what we did is the only thing we knew back then to do for user acquisition, and that is we did pay-per-click. So this is 2003. Mm. Google AdWords was relatively new. There wasn't a lot of competition. We had done some consulting for other businesses doing pay-per-click, so we knew a little bit about it. So that's, that's the only plan we had. We are going to put uh, $10,000 of our savings, the only savings we had, into pay-per-click to attract buyers to the platform. And... Yeah. Uh, Surprisingly, it worked. People ended up liking the idea. Now, and here is, here is the surprise. We um, realized quickly that people that used to buy voiceovers, they were not using us. The people using us were the people that were buying a voiceover for the first time. They didn't know how to do it, so they went online, they typed in voiceovers, they found us. Uh, only years later is that people that already knew how to buy voices is that they started using us. Um, because they so, didn't have the need. So people, when you say people that were doing it for the first time, you're, t you're talking about people that wanted to buy a voiceover. Yeah. Got it. So for the first time. So not, not the big companies out there that, because they obviously, they had, they had their channels of distribution. They had the, the, the people where they knew they would get voiceover. So it would be individuals, like small businesses. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, small businesses that uh, didn't know how to get a voice. So they went online, they type in voiceovers, and they say, oh, voiceovers online, voice one, two, three, okay, I'm going there. And, and that's, how, that's how we grew. And uh, we grew very quickly because we were the only ones suffering that back then. Were there any particular problems as it was growing that you began encountering that, uh, that, that were pretty scary? Oh, we'll need probably another whole hour of time just to go through <laughs> all of those. More than scary, it was probably challenging. We had a lot of, started to receive a lot of hate mail, a lot of it. Really? Uh, and uh, because we were really drastically changing the industry. So before Voice123, if you wanted to get a really good 30 second voiceover for a TV commercial, for example, yeah. you would have to go through a casting director. The casting director would contact several talent agents. Yep. They would contact the voice actors. The voice actors will be sent to an auditioning studio. They will record the audition, send it to the talent, the ta the, uh, to the agent. The agent will pick the best ones. Will, they would go to the casting director. The casting director would pick the best ones. They would go to the buyer. The buyer would pick the winner. Uh, then they will all meet on an actual recording studio for the session. And if everything went according to plan, then the buyer will pay to a paymaster. So the paymaster is yet another entity that gets the money and splits so the money into so different So there were so many people. players in all this layer. Yeah. So because of that, that 30-second voice will probably take three, week, three weeks to get and $3,000 or so plus royalties. Uh, we come in, we create an open marketplace where people compete and market dynamics. Now you can record from your home, you can send it, you can audition in five minutes, you don't have to go anywhere to audition, there are no middlemen. Uh, within a year or so, you could get a uh, voice of the same quality uh, within one day or so for $300. Wow. So uh, okay. a lot of people love the idea now because, because the voice of the industry used to be in the US centralized in LA, Chicago, and New York City. Now we had talents working from anywhere in the U.S. from their homes and building their own home studios. So the people that were used to the way the industry worked 
they didn't like that. And uh, they were, uh, some of them uh, started sending us a lot of hate messages, hate mail, uh, racist comments. Um, and uh, for some time, for several years, we thought that it was a xenophobia kind of thing. We thought that it was uh, people not liking that immigrants, that Latinos uh, were changing the industry. And uh, we were shy about uh, uh, telling others that we were uh, Latinos. In fact, as we hire more people in Colombia, because we have always had the connections with Colombia, right. we asked them to use American names as opposed to their, their, wow. their real names right, for that. Right. Uh, only Just to protect. Yeah, to protect them and protect the business and such. And only later is that we realized that that wasn't really the case. That yes, some people use um, uh, xenophobic slang, but the reason some people didn't like, most of the people that didn't like what we did, didn't, it wasn't because we were Latinos. It's just because we were disrupting the industry. And uh, so it, it wasn't about race or anything like that. But at the same time, we were also discovering how many other people loved what we were doing. And, and uh, uh, of course, the number of people that, 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 that we have positively affected their lives is way more than the number of people that and they are being affected negatively by this. And, and more and more, um, we see people thanking us. And every now and then, we are on the streets, and, and people identify our faces. And they say, oh, you guys are uh, Alex and Tanya, founders of Voice123. Yeah, can we take a picture? I'm a voice actor in there. You changed my life. Thank you. Uh, so that was uh, me. That would have been me if it wasn't that you guys are my neighbors. I'm like, that would be a little weird if I asked for his picture. I'm like, <laughs> I'm like we're in the same building. I don't know if that's uh, what's the proper protocol. What are there any particular lessons that come to mind that you say, oh man, if I saw myself ten years ago, I would sit me down and 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 just share, you know, this and this. So there are so many that I would probably buy a book <laughs> called Platform Revolution, one of the best books written on, on, on the topic of marketplaces and platforms of this century, and send it to, to myself 10 years ago. Yeah. <laughs> Read it, <laughs> and you're going to end up having a huge impact in humankind uh, if you follow the advice of that book. Platform Revolution. Do you remember the name of the author by any chance? Uh, it's, it's multiple authors. Uh, uh, it's a relatively uh, academic book. Okay. Uh, That's fine. Don't revolution. worry. Uh, Platform Revolution. Well, it, it depends on, on, of course, on what they want to achieve. But I think that the challenge for most Colombians is that they don't dream big enough. Mm. They, 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 their dreams are, are very limited by the context in which they were raised. The idea of doing something from Colombia that is going to change the world is foreign to most of them. At the most, they think they're going to be able to do something that changes Colombia, or at the most, it changes Latin America. But, but right. building something in Colombia that is going to, to have a, a global uh, impact? No. Uh, so that, that will be the first thing uh, for, for Colombians to, to stop thinking about the, and in general, Latin Americans, uh, stop thinking in terms of the imaginary political borders that some people set 200 years ago and realize that uh, we live in a global economy and that not even the sky is the limit. I mean, ask Elon Musk. Right. right. Uh, <laughs> no, you, there is no such a thing as a dream that is too big. That's great. That's great. Are there, uh, are there any podcasts you listen to or any reading aside from the Platform Revolution uh, that you would recommend? I listen a lot to Planet Money, a podcast from oh, NPR. Oh, I, I love Planet Money. Uh, I love it. Sometimes it's insightful. Sometimes it's, it's fun. And um, on a daily basis, I read Hacker News uh, a lot. I, some of the topics in there are, are quite insightful. Uh, cool. As well. Cool. Uh, all right. Well, is there anything else that you would uh, you would like to share before we uh, we conclude? Any any news on what you're working on now? Yes. So, Voice One Two Three is now part of a larger company called Torre. Uh, mm -hmm. Torre. We uh, our expertise is creating platforms that connect. Uh, demand with expertise needed for that demand. So we also have Bonnie Inc. And within Bonnie Inc., we have multiple brands. We have Voice Bonnie, which is the largest production service of voiceovers out there, writing Bonnie for 
buying um, uh, text uh, translation money for creative translations and such. We are expanding our bunnies to many different creative services uh, so that companies can outsource uh, anything creative when they need to do so. Mm. And uh, we are also working on uh, a couple of projects under the Torre brand, that's the name of the company, that are trying to make work fulfilling, that's the mission of our business, make work fulfilling for many people at a massive scale. We are going to be releasing some of those services pretty soon. And uh, so stay tuned. 